Okay, hello there. In this video, we're going to install Arch Linux onto one of these USB drives. And what I'm showing you here is a whole array of different brand names, uh, different size USB drives that I have used to try to install the operating system on. And so far, one of the cheapest and one of the best is this SanDisk. It's a 3.0 drive. This one happens to be 32 gigabytes. Plug that into my USB drive, and we're going to install Arch Linux XFCE desktop using Virtual Machine. Why would we use Virtual Machine? I'll explain in a second. This is the SanDisk I just plugged in there. As you can see, it's 32 gigabyte USB drive, and it's 3.0. So that's good. And I got it from Amazon, and you can see they're not very expensive. In fact, a couple of the more expensive ones I did purchase didn't work at all. One of them wouldn't even load the entire system on before it failed. So anyway, I got Arch Linux ready to boot up in the virtual machine here. And I've given it two core processors. I'm going to give it four gigabytes of RAM. I'm not going to enable the EFI. We're going to do legacy boot. Under display, I've turned the video memory all the way up. And storage, I've got the ISO there. Most importantly here, USB, I've enabled the USB 3.0. So that it'll recognize this. Or at least that's the theory. And you can see it's plugged in and it's... My host machine has it on the upper left of your screen there. Here we are, 29 gigabytes. Here we are at our login screen. We're going to hit enter to boot Arch Linux. And let me get out a full screen here so that I can see that icon up there for my USB drive. And you watch it disappear when I enable that drive. Now, the control of that drive has changed. Now it's under control of the virtual machine and Arch Linux. So the first thing it says do, ping, make sure we're online. So I'm going to ping google.com and I am. Now LSBLK, very important here. You see SDA is 52.5. That is the virtual hard drive. The SDB is the drive, our USB drive, the one that we're interested in. So time date CTL, we're going to see F disk in the device SDB. Now this drive has already had a system installed on it, so I'm going to eradicate that all together. Give it three gigabytes of swap space, which is may or may not be necessary in a USB drive. We're ready to write that out. You know, the USB drive is going to utilize whatever resources the uh, host machine has. LSB OK shows us our partitions on SDB. Just made swap on device SDB1. Turn the swap on on SDB1. Now we're going to make a file system of a .ext4 on SDB2. Now we're going to mount device SDB2 to MNT. Now we can LS be okay and see that SDB2 is now mounted. We're going to edit our mirror list manually here and at the top right there you'll see that this this was just generated on March the 1st 2020 and this is like March the 3rd or 4th. Probably don't really have to do this Wisdom may not be here. Rather than run reflector and being on a USB drive and all that, going through virtual box, I'm just going to do this manually. Get a few. Kind of funny, I didn't see any from Canada. Now we're ready to pack strap and install the base system onto our USB thumb drive. We're going to get all of the usual stuff and then a couple add-ons at, at the end here. So we got pack strap space slash MNT, base, base to bell, 
Linux for the kernel, Linux firmware, Nano, Network Manager, Network Manager Applet, MANDB, MAN Pages, USB Utils, GVFS, NTFS-3G, and now some extra stuff, Pac-Man Contrib, Reflector, M-Tools, DOS FS Tools, MDADM, GIT Git, WGIT, Yazil, Perl, S-Nail, Bash Completion, NumLock X, Dialog, IW, WP underscore Supplicant, Wireless underscore Tools, NetCTL, Init UTLs, and now AMD U code and Intel U code. And I recommend you get both of those because you don't know where you might plug your USB in. It might be AMD or Intel. This way you've got them both. So this is a 2 gig install. It's going to take a minute. But you can see the USB drive down at the bottom of your screen. It's flashing like crazy indicating that it's getting uh, some use. So it's just about through with the pack strap. Next step in the installation is going to be generate a FS tab. And just like normal, we're going to arch through in our newly installed system, which in this case happens to be on this 32 gigabyte flash drive. I don't know if you noticed, but surely you did when I run LSBLK. Well, let's gen FS tab first. You mount. You can follow along there. When, uh, when I ran the list block devices, you did not see the hard drive that were available from the host machine. The only thing we saw was what the virtual box thought was the host machine was its 52.5 gigabyte hard drive that I created for it. The other hard drive it saw was this USB. So that limits your chances of messing up your hard drive and your system because you want to install a system onto a USB. You'd have to go out of your way, I think, in VirtualBox following this guide to mess it up. VirtualBox only recognized the two drives, the virtual drive and the USB. At this point, yeah, it takes some tact to even try to find it with the command line. So now we're going to modify our etsylocale.com by putting our language in there that we just generated. Nano Etsy host name. In this case, it's just going to be two capital letters DH. Control O, enter, Control X, Control L. Nano Etsy host file 127.0.0.1. Tab local host colon colon one. Tab tab local host 127.0.1.1. Tab host name period local domain tab. Host name. Control O, enter, Control X, Control L. Password for the root user. Okay, so now we're going to add a user, add him to groups, all in one command here. So user add dash M dash G space sys log games network floppy power scanner ADM wheel. Audio, disk, input, LP, KVM, optical, storage, video, users, RF kill, space, hyphen, lowercase s, slash bin, slash bash, your username. In this case, it's Dennis. Verify that I'm in those groups by going groups in your username. Dennis needs a password, so password Dennis. Enter it and then confirm it. Now Dennis needs pseudo privileges. Let's go editor equals nano space by pseudo. I'm going to uncomment the 
Allow members of the group wheel to execute any command. Control O, enter. Control X, Control L to clear the screen. Now we're going to run an update, but just basically to synchronize our package databases. Nano Etsy Pacman.com. We're going to add a little flare to our own to our own liking or my own liking is tweak my pacman.conf file and while I'm here I'm going to enable multi-lib repositories for 32-bit software and it says see the pacman.conf man page for options and repository directories pacman-sygrub our base installation is complete with the exception of this grub Grub hyphen install give it a target dash dash target equals i386 dash pc space device sdb in my case make sure yours is whatever your letter is i'm going to tell it to recheck by typing in hyphen hyphen recheck now we got a grub make config so grub hyphen mkconfig space dash o space slash boot slash grub slash grub dot cfg okay control d is the same as typing in exit gonna unmount the one drive that we have mounted to mnt this is our thumb drive and now we're going to shut down I'm going to stick the thumb drive. I'm basically going to show the camera the thumb drive and then I'm going to stick it back in the computer. I'm going to power on my computer. Now I have my BIOS set up to boot to the USB first. When it starts up, it should automatically boot. So here I am. I'm sticking the SanDisk 32 gigabyte thumb drive right back into the computer in a 3.0 uh, slot power on the machine and now it should boot up to the thumb drive first and we'll know this if we get a command prompt if we go into a desktop we'll know it's not the usb it's my host machine so there we are we got a command prompt or a terminal prompt host name is capital D H capital D capital H so I'm gonna log in as my user right here and then I'm gonna go ahead and install everything I, or type in everything I need and I'll come back when I've got it all typed well, I went sudo pacman hyphen capital S space dash dash needed in case there's anything I'm asking for that it already has it won't reinstall it this starts from my X software all the way to fonts and I've got everything that I would normally put in an install on a hard drive. You're not going to need all this stuff. Some of this stuff may not even work for long on a hard drive. <laughs> like Caden Live, it's pretty resource hungry software. Even though it be utilizing the resources of the host machine, it's still a pretty good workout for that disk drive, I would guess. Once this gets started, I'll put the camera off, and I'll come back whenever it's closer to being finished. I think this was a four gigabyte install. So this is just a timestamp check here. You can see the running time is 40 minutes and 23 seconds at this point, and it's only 75% complete. So it's taking a while. <laughs> But that's because of the USB drive is, is limited. That's the gooseneck right there. It's not going to be as fast as your drive hooked up to your SATA port on your motherboard. And it was a little over one gig. Download size. Now it's 97%. Another time to check. 47 minutes and 27 seconds so far but it's almost finished come on you can do it like i said it's just bottlenecked up on this usb if you're just putting this on a hard drive or installing it in virtualbox 
you wouldn't expect it to be this slow. Ninety-eight percent. We're almost there. This one should do it. Forty-eight minutes and fourteen seconds. Fifty-seven seconds. Make that forty-nine minutes to just download. <laughs> now we got it installed. This is going to take a little while, although it won't take as long as the download did. <laughs> Thank goodness. So you can see it started off with my XORG stuff, and at the end it'll be on my fonts and such. Themes. I thought it was interesting. I'm showing this clip. I debated on showing it. Not often you get a chance to see this because it goes by so fast. The FS tools I asked for during Packstrap, you can see it's for FAT16 and FAT32 partitions. At the bottom of this list, you see M tools, utilities to access MS DOS disk. So that tells me, and I might be wrong if I am, somebody correct me. But without those two programs installed, you will not be able to take a flash drive that has been formatted under DOS. You wouldn't be able to recognize it, I don't think. Pretty sure that's right. So I just enabled the LightDM service. I went ahead and installed Yay, took advantage of the time there. Now we're going to reboot. We've got the thumb drive plugged in. It's going to boot to that. we still got Grub. And there's our login prompt. So I'm going to give it my password. Hit enter. And there we go. I installed Simple Screen Recorder in that last major download there, install. I'm going to go ahead and open up Simple Screen Recorder. And when I get this started, I'll turn the camera off and we'll pick up from where I hit the start button here. Or the start record button. Everything, it picked it right up, picked my mic right up. We're going to leave it called Simple Screen Recorder because I got one hand on the camera. <laughs> And we're going to start this, and through the magic of TV, I'm going to be right back from the simple screen recorder. This is where we was at. So you might ask yourself, other than this little extra safety net there of not being able to mess up your hard drive, why else would you consider putting an operating system of any kind on a USB drive? Well. I can think of three that come to my mind right off the bat. The first one has to do with convenience. I mean, I can put it in my pocket and I can go over to my pop's house or one of my friends or wherever. If they have a computer and I need to check my email, I can plug this USB into their computer, boot up to it, check my mail, power off, remove my USB, and there's no trace of what I've done on their computer. There's no trace whatsoever. That's pretty convenient. With the convenience also comes a little privacy. There was one of the YouTubers, I, I heard them say that they've been doing this for years. They have a live USB of Linux Mint, and they'll boot into that under the live settings pay all their bills, do whatever they need to do that might require some level of security, and then they power off. When they reboot the live USB again, everything is erased. It starts all over just like you just flashed it to the hard drive for the first time and booted up to it. So that's, that is a big level of security. But doing it this way, you've got almost the same security. As long as you're careful 
turn your history off in Firefox and a few little security measures, you'll have a lot of privacy. When you sit down and pull that thumb drive out, it's on two places. It's on the internet, which you can't stop anyway. And it's on that thumb drive, which you can stop with a hammer. A pot of boiling water, torch, something easily disposed of or removed or irrevocably <laughs> broke. <laughs> the third reason, which is probably one of the most important, is data rescue. If I had a Windows machine and I set it up and it had a C and a D drive, and for some reason C drive crashed and I couldn't boot into it, there is a chance. You know, you stand at least a 50-50 chance of being able to boot into this USB, recovering data off of whatever you can off of the host machine's original hard drive. And I'm not saying that works all the time because it's never worked all the time for me in my experiences, but that was always with Windows. I'm scared to mess with uh, Audacity right here and because I think it'll mess with the sound on Simple Screen Recorder, and guess what? <laughs> it did. <laughs> so that's one of the reasons why I'm having an overdub here. Completely quit recording audio. Video still recorded, but the audio shut out. So you can see all those programs that I installed here. Average person is not going to be needing these on any kind of temporary basis that the USB drive will offer. But I put them on here to show you that they would be available, and they do work. Everything you put in here will work. You know, even though it's pulling resources from the host machine, it's still a thumb drive, and it still works on that thumb drive. Be mindful of the heat and don't hang a keychain off of it while you're hanging it off of a tower or something because that might mess up both the USB and your computer. But you can see it's utilizing the host machine, which is four cores or four processors, and we got 12 gigabytes of RAM in this machine. It's recognizing those and it's utilizing those just like if it was a hard drive plugged into the machine. So you got several benefits of reason why you might want to do this my son he uses his he'll stick his in his pocket and then he does things at work and when he needs to work on something later or does something at home and, and vice versa needs to bring it to work that he can just boot up to his his mint stick he's got all the access to all of his computer programs Now, I would also suggest that in today's computer world that you make two USB sticks, one like we just did for Legacy Boot, and then I made another one that was using UEFI mode. That way, if I get to a situation where I'm at a house that's got Legacy Mode enabled and I don't have to go through their BIOS and enable the UEFI, and then have to reset it all, that could be a hassle. This way you're prepared for no matter which system is there. And if I'm not mistaken, I think I seen something not long ago that indicated that you could put both the UEFI and Legacy on the same USB stick. Here I'm showing you that if you, you know, you do your banking, your shopping or whatever online, then once you power off and pull that USB stick out, then that's gone. It's in your pocket, so to speak. Pretty good system control, I would guess. Pretty good system data control. Now, you're limited to the size of the flash drive that you get. But you see, it came in like 16, 32, 64, 128. Comes in pretty good sizes, and I can't imagine walking around needing that much data storage in my on a USB drive. At the most, you might want to store a, a 
just say a movie from somebody's house that was five gigs or whatever. That'd be about the biggest thing I'd want. I can see myself putting on there. So here I'm gonna show you opening up G Parted. I'm showing you it defaulted to the uh, SDA, which is the host machine. So you can now at this point see the host machine's hard drive. Device SDA2, if that was my C drive and it was corrupt, had a, I don't know, mount point something broke right there, and I couldn't access it. Well, I could plug this USB in and hopefully be able to access SDA3 or D drive, pull data off of it. <laughs> How awesome would that be? You know, you might be in a situation where you're not a very good backer upper and you, you stand a chance of losing most of your most valuable stuff. Still, you need to back your information up. If anybody ever give some advice about a computer, it's the best one is keep your data backed up. So there's a lot of programs that you could utilize this with and for. You see the first one there is a sunder. If you went over to your buddy's house and he had a CD, but you wanted to rip it to your hard drive and he didn't have a way of doing that, you could just rip it yourself. Or he didn't have a way of ripping it to his hard drive. You could rip it for him. <laughs> so there's a, to me, there's just a big world of possibilities when you walk around with a computer in your pocket. Possibilities that you used to not have. And I don't know that this method works with every operating system, but I do know that it works with Ubuntu, MX Linux, Debian, Arch. In other words, the ones that I have tried it with. Peppermint. All right, well, I guess this video is over. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next time. Bye.